Okay, so this week it's the 10th episode of the weekly GMBN Tech Show. So thank you all for following it so far and I hope you continue to do so. As you may have noticed, I'm not in uh, the GMBN Tech set as usual. I'm lucky enough to be here in Stellenbosch in South Africa where I've been watching and reporting on all the tech from the first round of the Cross Country World Cup series. So I just want to say a massive thanks to all that GMBN South African fans out here. I'm absolutely overwhelmed by the amount of you and so many of you came to say hi so really cool to meet you all and hopefully we're going to come and do some content out here again soon. So coming up on the show this week we've got some XE tech related news from Stellenbosch where I am here. We've got all the usuals from you guys and we've got some info on that new Da Vinci 29er downhill bike. First into tech news and the first thing is what everyone wants to know about at the moment is what is that rear derailleur on Nino Schurter's Scott race bike. Of course it's the new SRAM black box rear derailleur, it's being dubbed as the ETAP system. And I took a good look at the bike and we can tell you that it is an electronic and it is a wireless shifting system although the Scott mechanics would not let us see the shifter and they refused to comment on it. Have a look at this little clip from our shot for the tech walk through the pits. So undoubtedly this has been the bike that everyone has been talking about here in Stellenbosch for the first round of the World Cup. It of course belongs to Nino Scherzo who's a reigning world champion and in particular what everyone wants to know is what is going on here from SRAM. So it's their new rear derailleur system. We know that it's a wireless type system. It's got the black box stickers on there. A lot of people have been saying it's ETAP but of course we know that is associated with the road world. The black box is what we know for the development on the mountain bike side of things. On this particular bike we are not allowed to see the shifter. The shifter has been taken off the bike so we can't see that. But you can see the shifter in some of the videos on Nina Schurter's Instagram page. You can see him actually using that. And of course there it is in all its glory. Cannot wait to see and play with us ourselves. Canadian company Da Vinci are next to join the 29 inch bandwagon for downhill bikes. And they've revamped their Wilson, which is a really, really good downhill bike made very popular by the late Stevie Smith. And of course, now it has 29 inch wheels, although this one is a prototype, but we're assured that this will see production at some point. And it's being raced by Dakota Norton, so expect to see this bike out doing the rounds around the world. I think this year may well be the year of 29. It kind of happened last year and downhill to a degree. Obviously it's well documented what the Santa Cruz Syndicate did. But I think now that other riders have had time to really develop and refine the 29er platforms, we're going to see a lot more this season. Really, really excited to see the race season kick off. So Team Specialized Gravity have announced that they're going to start a partnership with Magura Brakes. Now we're well aware that the cross country team all use the MT8 Raceline Magura hydraulic brakes with those really cool fluorescent yellow calipers and it seems like a natural move for the downhill team to do that. One of the things that's really interesting about this is that the downhill team really seems to help develop new products and with riders such as Loic Bruni riding their products I, re I reckon there's going to be a brand new brake coming. I think there's going to be a lot of development work. They're not the sort of team that are just going to sit back and ride what exists. They're going to refine it and they're going to come up with something pretty special. So make sure you keep an eye on Lloyd Bruni's bike and see what comes up. Another thing I spotted here at Stellenbosch in South Africa was that Emily Batty was running a metric shock on her top fuel race bike. So as you might know, the top fuel bike doesn't currently have a metric shock on there. So they redesigned a complete linkage for her to run that and she's been doing suspension testing to see how it's going to feel. So you can expect to see in a future version of the top fuel bike, they're going to be moving that to metric. And of course, combine that with a Debonair spring that you're going to start seeing on the front forks, you're going to have an unbelievably active suspension platform on a very short travel, a very lightweight World Cup style bike. Really good stuff that is. Intense have got a brand new XC platform. It's called the Sniper and they do an XC version and a trail version. The XC version with 29 inch wheels got 100 millimeters of travel and the trail version has got 120 millimeters of travel and that's the one I've got my money on as an absolute rocket ship. So one of the things that they've really been refining over the last few years is their geometry. Of course they've been doing what everyone else hangs on Monica on, the long low slack thing, but they genuinely are. So on the 100 mil platform bike they've got a 44 millimeter offset fork and a 51 mil offset on the 120 mil bike so it really gives them the confidence of a slightly bigger travel bike but it keeps that responsiveness of a shorter travel bike arguably the best of both worlds there there's a real good long wheelbase there that's obviously it's an asset in stability and traction and it helps when riding that rough terrain 
and of course the BB height is 13 inch on the Sniper and 13.3 on the Sniper Trail. So it's still nice and low, but not too low that you're gonna be slamming your feet on the, on the deck all the time, which also means you can run cranks as long as 175, so you're not having to bash them on the floor all the time. Have a good look at the finish on this bike. As usual with Intense, it's got that Formula One thing going on. They've always managed to have a really, really nice bike. I can't wait to actually check it out in the flesh because I haven't seen it yet. And finally, although it's not that new a product, GoPro Fusion is available to buy now. And we saw Nino Schurter blasting around here on the World Cup course with it bolted onto the front of his bike. Check out this footage he's taken with it. It's absolutely mind blowing. And of course, we know that you can get other cameras like Kodak and various different brands out there that film 360 footage. But with GoPro behind it, it's gonna become a whole lot more intuitive to use and far more easy to post socially and just use in a daily sort of workflow with the way you wanna do your social media. I reckon this GoPro Fusion could be a really, really cool addition for all you budding filmmakers out there. And finally, I just wanna throw you to the tech video that went up yesterday that we uploaded from here live and it's got loads of interesting bits and pieces we saw during the XC race. Virtually all of the pro bikes that we've been checking out here in Stellenbosch are running the rotor two in cranks. So they're power meter cranks and the crank arms themselves are a work of art. They're absolutely gorgeous and they're all hollowed out on the inside They have the crank caps on the end to keep dust and stuff out of them. The thing that's different about the two in cranks compared to other power meters is the fact that it independently measures the output of both of your legs. So it's a far more accurate way of training and working on those imbalances in leg strength and the way that you turn the pedal circles around. We were looking at Jaroslav Kulhavi's bike and his mechanic showed us the difference between him running on regular round chain rings and on oval chain rings. You can really see some sort of difference between the pedaling circle. Someone who pedals quite radically is gonna have quite a round profile to that. And Euroslav's was just so smooth to look at. So it clearly works very well for him. Okay, so next up is reader comments. Um, just gonna jump straight in and keep this a bit quicker than usual. So Anuj Kalmain says, you guys missed out on Canyon's new XC full sus. They've been hiding it. But if you look at the Topic race team behind them, you'll see that Matthew van der Poel will probably be racing one. Yeah, we did see van der Poel blasting around, but never saw him in the pit, so never actually got to have a look at his bike, although we could tell from certain angles that it was that full suspension frame, which is rumored to be the Lux, which makes sense, because the Lux has been around for a while. Now, we did see Paul in Ferran Prevo racing that bike and also in practice, and there's a whole bunch of shots I got. When she's blasting through the pits, I managed to just snipe her out with a 200mm lens there and just get these pictures. Of course, we didn't manage to track her down. Saw her in the race. Obviously, she's busy racing. Can't really stop her for a, for a comment there. But we will have more information on that bike soon. Dan Abt. Um, Doddy, how did you get your name on a WD-40 can? Um, it's basically just a sticker on the top. WD-40 were doing a very short run promotional thing at a UK trade show I went to recently. And loads of people had them done. I suspect you might see something like this in the future from them. So have to keep an eye out for that. Uh, next up is from Progress B athlete Sean Lynch, who says the rally documentary is called Peddling Dreams. Thank you for that, because I wanted to know that so I can look it up. And I think it's on iPlayer. So uh, when I find it, I'll post it on my uh, GMBN Tech Facebook page so you can have a look at that yourselves. And finally, the next one up is from ZWBI Zuby. Uh, check out Superstar Components for a headset. I bought a complete headset for 35 quid and it's performed much better than anything else I've used. They include rubber seals on a crown race and a top bearing cover, which does a great job at keeping the crud out. That sounds like a brilliant price for a headset. And I'm glad that you, you guys are picking this stuff up as well, because you shouldn't have to spend much on certain parts of the bike. Obviously, you can get a really nice finished one to put on you know, your high-end bike of XTR and that, but it's just a workhorse part of the bike. You're better off spending decent money on something else. So yeah, that's a good shout. I might look at the Superstar components for that. I like the sound of those. Next up is Bike Cave. So hopefully I'm gonna be able to see all these images properly for all the reflection. So we're gonna start up, and the first one is from Anthony Webb in Dorset. Uh, thought you might like to see my Bike Cave complete with washing machine, good man, and tumble dryer for your riding gear. Cabinet for helmets, oh, I love those cabinets. That's exactly like those ones we saw the other week, actually. And what's that? Oh, you've got Canyon Sender. That's really similar to the one that I'm just about to send back. Nice bike now, oh, you specialize in Duro as well. I oh, like in the pegboard. That is my sort of garage. That is, that is a decent bike cave. I'm pretty sure you've emailed us before, Anthony. I, I recognize your name. Um, but wicked, thank you for sending that in. That looks awesome. Uh, next one up is from Dean Lumsden. I've sent some photos of my bike cave the other day, but they're not good enough quality, so here's some fresh ones. I live in Cornwall, 
and we have some really good trails in the region. I've created a map that highlights them and this opens up into my bar, which needs restocking. <laughs> nice touch. I love the fact you've got an actual bar in your bike cave. I am definitely going to do that in mine. I'm so into that. I'll tell you what, Dean, that is really neat and tidy. Could pretty much pull up a camp bed in there and I'd be quite content to sleep in there. I like the fact also you've got a washing machine in there as well. Like, like most people with some sort of dedicated room like this, you, you've obviously got to have some sort of utilitarian use for it. So whether it's for doing the washing for the house or just an old washing machine you're using for your bike stuff. Definitely approve of that. Liking the maps and stuff in there. I especially like the uh, mini bar though. What's not to like? Oh, I just noticed you've got a little, little sort of bar tables there underneath your jump bike. That's pretty cool. Okay, so next up is from uh, Mark Rosenkrantz. My name's Mark, I'm 17 years old from Berlin in Germany. I'm sending you a picture of my bike cave in my cellar. Costs less than 30 euros to build and I sprayed it all in the colour scheme of my bike stuff. As you can see, I really love my Canyon bike and I wanted to stay in a special room. Of course, you've got to treasure that belonging, that's what it's all about. Uh, if you like it, it'd be an honour to show it on the GMBN show. Well, we're honoured for you to send these in, that's why I love showing this stuff. So thanks Mark in advance for that. Um, also, your bike you're saying is Canyon Euron AL 7.0. I replaced the original seat post with a RockSox Reverb Stealth 150mm travel. Nice, so full downhill capabilities within that. The complete cockpit is built with six pack parts. Hope you like it. Yeah, that's a, good, a lot of colour, a lot of black and yellow going on in there, matching the bike with the sort of hazard print holding the bike up, your tool board on the back, a little display there with your helmets on. Nice, that's tidy. Obviously it's small and functional, but it does everything you need it to do. Good work, Mark. Next up is from Craig Fernley. Uh, he's got limited space, it's in pool. And the thing I love about this one is it's a garden shed. Good old sheds, I love a shed. And putting it to good use, you've obviously got the, uh, the garden lawnmower and stuff like cast aside in there and you've got your tools hung on the wall. So I like to see your priorities there. I would say though, like looking at the stain on the floor in there, you probably want to get some sort of oil mat or you know, rubber mat in there. So if, when you're working on your bike, you're not just going to rot all that. The thing I love about this, Craig, is it's, it's a garden shed. That's like a pretty much a staple thing for people in the UK to have. I haven't got one yet. I have to have a garden shed too. If, yours is a, if your bike cave's a garden shed, let us know. Tag us bike cave shed. Let's see those coming in. Love seeing your bike caves and where you guys are working on your bikes. Please continue to send them in. And if you can, remember to use the hashtag in the subject line, hashtag bike cave. It makes it way easier to find them all because we're getting so many emails from you guys now. So it helps me find them and you're more likely to get on next week's show. So next up is Rewind. Of course, I love my retro stuff. So this is one of my little highlights of the show. So first up is from Danon who says, as a huge fan of 80s and 90s mountain bikes um, that I've been seeing on the show, I thought I'd share mine with you. Um, she's outdated from shredding any single track, but perfect downtown on the riverbanks and levees. Oh my God, that's a, that's a Richie. What's that, Richie Timberwolf? Full mud guards, 26 inch chrome mud guards. Oh, I love the one piece bar and stem, that is so retro. And the four finger brake levers. Is that, I don't think you've got cantilever on a brake. It looks like you've got a U-brake. A U brake and then a cantilever on the front. Huge old school crank set on there. Four finger brake levers, thumb shifters. That is amazing condition. I love the shot as well. Thanks for sending that in, Dan. I'm definitely really into that. He says, keep the retro bikes coming. Yeah, we will. You keep sending them in, we'll keep putting them up. Next one up is from Tony Chambers, which is his mid 90s FSR comp. Do you know what? That's in really good condition, Tony. So you've done a lot to this as well. So you swapped out your disc brakes, grow makers for the uh, original Hope M4s. Um, you put a torque arm on there to the V-brake mount to allow you to fit that disc on the back. That's a, that's a pretty good hop up. That's a top mod, I'd say. Mavic D321 rims. Oh, that's nice because that's a disc version of the 521. So back in the day when you, know, you had various different brake types, Mavic used to have the option of having a sidewall on there for braking, or of course, a slightly different profile one which in my opinion looked a lot nicer. And of course that gave birth to the full sort of disc specific rims we see now. Um, just for the laugh, Manitou twos. Oh man, that is a lovely fork. Oh, I, still, I still really want a pair of RockShox ones, like the RS one and a pair of Manitou ones. I mean, a Manitou one, I think just aesthetically is one of the best looking forks ever designed. Of course, it'd be terrible in performance by today's standards, but uh, but a two was certainly very close to it. The brace on there just looks a bit more sort of industrial 
looking and of course it had improved internals in there but still has that same sort of machined aluminium shape to it that's a lovely one really cool to see those Grimeca brakes as well I'd kind of forgotten they existed to be honest they share a lot of similarities with the early formulas and actually with some of the more modern Maguris in, this, uh, in the way the brake lever comes out of the sort of the body there but nice to see that and really cool to see the condition of that although something that is quite alarming is um, the length of that stem that's nearly as long as your top tube dude but, uh, but that's how it was back then. But yeah, well into that. Thanks for sending that in, Tony. Nice to see that. Next one up is from Rob Baker, who's sending us his Proflex 757. Oh man, that's a bike and a half. So what year is that? So 1997, and you've got Magura HS33 Raceline hydraulic rim brakes. So they're bright yellow, the same sort of look as the Specialized team are running. And of course the new Specialized Gravity team. Those brakes were so sought after back in the day because of people, I think, like Martin Ashton, who really promoted them through trials riding. Immensely powerful, um, given the fact that they were rim brakes back then and obviously subject to the conditions of the rims. So your Proflex, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's one of the ones that's got the no lean rear shock on there. If it is, it's definitely one of the better ones than the earlier ones, which of course had the MCU urethane on there. And of course the fork is the more modern version as well. But that's really nice. There's something about a Proflex because they were one of the first dedicated suspension brands. So they were, they were called Off-Road originally, weren't they? So it was Off-Road Proflex. They also made a hardtail, which came with the, the flex stem on there. But yeah, nice. Really nice to see that. Next one up and the last one this week in, in Rewind is from Louis Diamade or Diamade. Uh, so here are some shots of my Bridgestone mountain bike converted into a touring bike that my father pedaled in Australia, Southeast Asia, China, Tibet and Europe. The frame is a circa 1992 Bridgestone M MB4. He started cycling around the world from Japan on, in 1987 on a Yamakuni aluminium frame. But in 94, that frame cracked after visiting many different countries. And after a quick visit to New York working in a bike shop, he was given the MB4 by a friend to continue his journey and swapped out all the parts from the Yamakuni onto it. Wow, so this has got a proper story behind it. This is, this is a bit more than your usual rewind entry. The drop bars were time trial bars, uh, which offered lots of different riding positions for long days in a saddle. Yeah, I've seen that on a few people's sort of adventure bikes. Um, and also for hanging socks and underwear to dry. Nice touch. The XT shifters are mounted on the TT bars, something the Shimano engineer told him when he was living in Japan. Um, and when he lived in Australia, he fitted the newfangled seven-speed cassette and hub, which would, uh, when the freewheel to cassette transition happened, yeah, well, I'd, say I'd, I'd almost forgotten that happened. So back in the day, you used to have a screw-on freewheel, and basically the bearings in the hub would be like off-center. So when the cassette system came out, it had a cassette body that spread the load of the rear hub through different bearings, and then the cassette would slide on over the top of that and hold on. Obviously, the cassette system is what we use today. It's a much better system, the old screw-on style ones. But yeah, I'd kind of forgotten there was that transitional period. Uh, the old full XT group set is as good as bomb proof, so it's a good choice for long distance touring. Yeah, it was always known as the workhorse, and I think it still is today, to be honest. It's like it's not the flashiest group set, but it's really dependable, and whilst it's not the cheapest, you're going to get really good sort of durability from it. Oh man, like this is really, really cool to see. And I love all the random stuff on it, like the extensive amount of bottle cages, and then you've got it looks like spokes strapped on there onto the bottle cage and then there's some random kangaroo thing strapped on the back of the saddle. I love it. I honestly love the fact this bike has been everywhere and there's a story to every single thing on it. If you've got any more pictures, just on a personal note, I'd really like to see them. Those, please send those in. So the ones you sent are great, but thanks for that, Louis. That's a really nice sort of trip down memory lane. Please guys, continue to send in your retro stuff to the rewind hashtag, like fire them in, email address on the screen. Let us know what you've got in the comments below. If you haven't got photos of them, you just want to tell us about some stuff, Tell us and I can find some stuff and I can talk about it on the show. We love just sort of telling you guys about the retro stuff and I love seeing it. Okay, now it's time for Top Mods. This is where you guys send in images or video footage of the modifications you've made to your bikes to improve them. That could be anything from a pair of handlebar grips to everything. Like whatever it is, send it in. However small it is, it's an improvement. I want to see it. So first up is from Anthony Howard. Oh, you're a man after my own heart. So it's a Mondraker June Carbon Art in black, like stealthy as anything. That is a lovely looking bike. And what have you got on there? So you've got Hope Hubs, Hope V4 brakes on there. A 2018 170 mil travel Lyric. That's a great fork. I had one of those on my old Mondraker. Um, it was a 2017 model, but like such a good fork. 
uh, Bergtech saddle and bars, gold KMC chain, very trick. And DMR Brendog vaults, they're the matte black ones. Like, oh, with gold pins on as well. Cheeky. Yeah, that is a lovely looking bike. And plenty of great top mods on there. Thanks, Anthony, for sending that in. Well into that. Next one's got a bit of a good story. This is from Alvaro Cabrera. So he says, this is his first bike. Got the frame from my uncle a year ago and he's been investing on it ever since. It's a 2003 Giant VT2. So that was one of their earlier sort of trail-based suspension designs. It was actually really good. It was just a bit odd for their range at the time, I think. You know, they were quite focused on cross-country-based stuff, but that was a really good bike. So I see you've got a Fox Talus 32 on there with 100 to 140 mil travel. Some deal cranks. Uh, you say you used to have XT, but had problems with the threads. Haze 9 carbon brakes, very nice. Some 780 mil specialized handlebars. Front wheel is NS Bytes Enigma with 26 inch Maxxis 2.4 high roller twos. Very nice. Manitou Swinger SPV, so that's the stable platform valve, four way shock. So that's very similar to the fifth element shock. Don't know if you guys remember that when that came out. And you could adjust the stable platform in it, so it had an inertia valve. Very similar to things you see in off road racing trucks with all that crazy suspension. It's so it stops body roll basically on them. So the suspension still works, but the car won't wallow to sort of the weight of itself. So it's the same principle with pedaling and stuff off road. Um, really good, dude. Like you've done a hell of a lot of stuff to this bike. Like it's, it's all the top mods I think you've done on here. And it's really nice to see the bike still going, to be honest, because it's not the newest bike out there, but it's great to see that you've still got this out on the trail. And I kind of like the weird fact that the front wheel is orange on there. It looks good. The only thing I'm not too sure about, it's just a visual thing, of course. It's like you've obviously put it on there because it's comfy. Is that saddle there? It looks like, um, it looks like one of those old Physic downhill saddles. Can't be too sure, but generally, I love your bike, dude. And thanks for sending that in. Really nice entry there. Next up is from Jake Roberts, who's got an orange. So, well, it's an orange, but it's fluorescent yellow. My recent mod is upgrading the RockShox reverb lever following crashing and breaking the old one. And of course you've replaced it with one of the new ones. They're really, really good. So nice to use. It's much more intuitive. It's like using like a, a shifter for changing gear. It's just in a natural position. There was nothing wrong with the performance of the existing reverb lever. It's just you had to sort of move your hand away from the, the grip so it wasn't in a sort of mechanically strong sort of place. But yeah, that's a nice entry there, Jake. Good work. And finally, the last one is from Thomas White on the Isle of Wight, so from where Blake lives at the moment. Hi, GMBN Tech. I replaced the chain on my bike, but I didn't want to just throw away the old one, so I've made a two-piece chain necklace. Not the most beautiful thing in the world, but at least people know I'm an avid mountain biker. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I like a bit of bike art, a bit of jewellery and stuff. That's quite cool. I used to do that sort of stuff when I was a bit younger. Like, I've still got like chain links on my house keys and all that sort of stuff, so well into that. Thank you, Thomas, for sending that in. Good effort. Please continue, guys, to send those top mods in. Love seeing those things. And now it's time for Tech of the Week. And this week, it, for me, it has to be the RockShox Twist Lock, which is their new lockout operated system that works in a place of where you would normally have a grip shift, like left hand shifter. It's so neat and tidy. Anton Cooper had one on his bike. Emily Batty had one on hers. I got to play with that one a bit and just sort of like change it and sort of feel the click on it. Really, really nice bit of kit to use. Have a look at this. So some of the cool tech we've been seeing here in Stellenbosch, largely involved around rock shock. So you might notice on Emily Batty's bike here, she's got like a custom metric shock set up with a unique linkage. But more importantly, you can see there's a remote lockout on there. So Jerome Clements and a few of the EWS racers were using grip shift left hand shifters to operate lockout on their shocks and stuff. But now rock shocks have got a dedicated one and it's going to be available very soon. As you can see, it's a really nice twist shift action. Check that out. At the moment, we don't have any release date on it, but it's a finalized item. The ones that were on their bikes were no longer prototypes. They were working sort of uh, last batch units. So they're gonna be in production soon. Expect to hear news on maybe next week's show. So just this is just an update on bike build. I'm obviously not at home in the office at the moment, so I can't tell if it's there. I have got a couple of emails saying I've had some parcels delivered. So I'm hoping that one of those is that Santa Cruz Nomad aluminium frame. So I'm gonna to have to jump to this next week, I'm afraid. So there you go, that's another show in a bag and I've loved presenting it on the fact that I'm sat on the World Cup course on a pickup stick section, which is one of the gnarliest bits of the course. Course is closed at the moment while the marshals are taking down all the race tape and that. So kind of nice to sit here and just absorb it all a bit. 
Thanks for watching guys and I'll see you all again next week. For a couple more great videos, click down here to see Yaroslav Kulhavi's specialised Epic that right now as we're speaking he is on his way to the Cape Epic to race it and then after that it's going to be auctioned off for charity. So find out about that in that video. And if you want to see all those other XC related tech bits I found here in Stellenbosch, click down here. As always, click on that globe to subscribe. And then if you like the video, give us a thumbs up guys.